Good evening, everybody. We are on our 52nd edition of the live webinar series on orthopedic principles. We are back with Yogesh Joshi from Wrexham, United Kingdom. Today is going to enlighten us on the postlateral corner of the knee and some of the questions that appear for the fellowship exam. Over to you, Dr. Yogesh. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Gopalan, um, it's always a pleasure to present on your webinar. Um, we are going to talk about the postulateral corner of the knee today. I'm Mr. Joshi. Um, I work as a consultant knee surgeon in Rexham Island Hospital, beautiful part of the world um, in North Wales in UK. Um, the aim of this webinar is to go through the postulateral corner of the knee. We'll talk about the anatomy, um, basic structures, the stabilizers of the postulateral corner, the primary stabilizers, secondary stabilizers, and then the mechanics, um, what kind of restraints uh, you can get uh, through the postulateral corner. We'll talk about the clinical evaluation, how to examine a patient with postulateral corner injury, and then imaging um, and investigation, as well as how to treat this kind of injuries and what is the outcome of these kind of surgeries that we provide to these kind of uh, patients. Um, it is quite a complex area of the knee and it's very important to know what constitutes a postulateral corner injury. So if you understand the basics, then obviously you can understand what entails to reconstruct these kind of injuries. So these are significant injuries. Um, they do happen in high velocity, high velocity injuries. They can happen in low velocity injuries, uh, usually uh, as a sprains, um, which are grade one or grade two, and this can be treated easily. Um, if it's a high velocity injuries, you need to look into whether it's isolated injury or whether there are significant other ligamentous injuries in. Um, in, in, in the knee. They're not so uncommon. Uh, they are present along with other injuries like ACL or PCL injuries. They can be subtle and hence there has to be a higher index of suspicion because if you neglect these injuries, the primary repair to any of the other ligament reconstructions that you do, um, especially ACL reconstruction will fail. Uh, hence, we have to understand uh, the significance of these injuries. And complete lesions don't heal with non-operative treatment. So if you just ignore it and treat it non-operatively, uh, then obviously the patient will have a very bad outcome. And that is very important to know what the prognosis of these kind of injuries are. And you can understand the prognosis only if you know what the biomechanical importance of these structures are. So we'll go through various um, anatomical structures over the postural uh, corner of the knee uh, and we'll go in detail as to how they are important in these uh, scenarios. So it was called the dark side of the knee because um, not much was known about the postlateral corners um, of the knee. Um, it's only recently that we have got lots of anatomical studies as well as biomechanical studies to know which are the structures that are important in the postlateral corner of the knee. During the medical school, you've been taught about loads of structures, uh, smaller ligaments and uh, fibrous tissues. Um, although the important ones are uh, the, the ones that we need to focus on and uh, to deconstruct them. They are associated with ACL, PCL injuries and uh, isolated postulateral corner injuries are quite a minor portion of this. Um, and if you fail to address this, then obviously, not only it will cause the failure of the reconstruction of ACL and PCL, but it can also lead to a biomechanical disadvantage knee and lead to arthrosis, especially in the chronic situation. Examination uh, is quite important. Uh, we need to know which are the structures that are torn um, and whether it's an isolated injury clinically or uh, it's a combination of a postlateral corner with the ACL or a PCL injury. We will go through this in uh, the next few slides. 
radiology uh, wise, we need to, uh, especially because they are more of a soft tissue structures. Um, MRI scan is one of the gold, uh, uh, gold um, uh, investigations of choice. So um, always, if you suspect a postlateral coronary injuries, always think about how you're going to diagnose this. Treatment-wise, uh, we will go through uh, the non-operative management of these kind of injuries, as well as we will touch a bit on the operative management of these injuries. And lots have changed in the recent years. We know we have got better understanding as how this work, and we have got now better understanding how to reconstruct these structures as well. So going through the anatomy, uh, there are stabilizers, uh, so static stabilizers and dynamic stabilizers of the postlateral corner of the knee. And we'll go through various structures in detail. The main static stabilizers are the lateral collateral ligament, the popliteus tendon, and the popliteal fibular ligament. And these are the three structures which are uh, going to be addressed during, if you do a surgery, these are the three structures that you need to address because these uh, will lead to improved outcome. If you don't do a reconstruction which is anatomic, then the uh, reconstruction results are poor. I'm just going to uh, now go through the anatomical slides. Um, so this is the anatomical structures of the posterolateral corner of the knee. This is the iliotibial band, which is going all the way from the proximal to the hip to the distal to the knee. And this is in the layer um, one of the postlateral corner of the knee. This is the biceps tendon. Uh, there is two heads of the biceps tendon, the uh, long head and the short head. And the long head has got a distinct attachment of the on the fibular head. It divides into two bands and it and uh, wraps up the fibular collateral ligament or the lateral collateral ligament before it attaches to the fibula. And you can see there is this big nerve, that's the common peroneal nerve, which comes beneath or underneath the biceps femoris uh, tendon and goes across over to the fibular neck and it crosses the fibular neck down there. Deeper to these structures are um, the ligaments. And uh, we can actually see the ligament as we dissect these structures. So if we take the iliotibial band off and the biceps femoris off, then we have got the deeper structures. And you can see there's this geniculate artery, the uh, lateral inferior geniculate artery, which you will encounter when you um, approach this part of the knee. And that is quite important to address because if you don't address that, uh, then there will be a lot of bleeding. That one is the lateral collateral ligament. It just rises from the femoral condyle, lateral femoral epicondyle, and goes down uh, to the femoral head. This is the popliteus tendon, which attaches around the uh, fib, uh, femoral epicondyle as well. And we will go through the exact attachments of these um, structures in detail because we need to know where they attach so that we can reconstruct them anatomically. That is the part of the arcuate ligament, which is a complex structure of the posterolateral corner of the knee. And um, we will also touch a brief on the arcuate ligament. The arcuate ligament was first, uh, nomen the nomenclature was done by um, uh, Lars, who also defined various other structures of the posterolateral corner of the knee. And um, because of the complications of complicated uh, nomenclature, uh, we have now got a simplified structures um, that we could identify and uh, the main structures uh, that we can reconstruct. And we'll go through them as well. I'm just going to go back to the presentation slide now. So if you look at the evolution, uh, how, how things have changed in the last few uh, thousand years, the fibula was articulating with the femur uh, in, in, um, uh, in the primitive um, humans and the animal uh, kingdom. 
and the fibula when it was attached to the femur there was a meniscus uh, between the fibula and the femur and that has now developed into what we now call as the uh, the operative fibular ligament there were the lateral collateral ligament which has now a distinct structure in humans as they um, you know evolve and because of the descent of the fibula from the femur to the tibia uh, the, the complexity of uh, the postlateral corner structures are um, there and and that's what we need to understand it's not an easy uh, part of the knee um, and we'll go through it in the next few anatomical slides. So if you look at this slide, uh, it's the lateral collateral ligament. So the lateral collateral ligament attaches to the femur or the lateral epicondyle. Lateral epicondyle is just down there and it's ever so slightly proximal and posterior to the lateral uh, femoral condyle. And you, that is very important because when you drill the femoral uh, tunnel, in, it has to be posterior and proximal to the lateral epicondyle of the femur. It goes down straight down uh, and attaches to the fibula um, head or the anterior um, part, anterior and the middle part of the fibula head. And that is very important when you make a femoral, uh, a fibular tunnel uh, as if, if you want to recreate the anatomical um, landmark. It is in close proximity with the lateral meniscus as well as the popliteus tendon. This is the slide for the popliteus tendon. And if you see the popliteus tendon attaches into the popliteal sulcus. And it is more of the anterior half of the popliteal sulcus that is where it is attached. And it goes, uh, and it, at this attachment in the femur, it is intraarticular structures. Um, it goes down and beyond, and it, uh, it attaches to the tibia as a fleshy muscle. As you see, the popliteus is attached with, with various kinds of other ligaments as well. And there are very uh, few fibrous structures attached to the popliteus uh, muscle and the tendon at the muscular tendinous junction. And this is the reason why it is a static structure or static stabilizer and not dynamic stabilizer of the post postolateral corner of the knee. And it is an important part of the reconstruction uh, of the postlateral corner to address the popliteus um, tendon. So this is the slide for the popliteal fibular ligament. Now it is a very, very thick ligament from the, the junction of the muscular tendinous part of the popliteus tendon to the fibular the tip of the fibula. It has been divided into posterior part and anterior part. The anterior part goes all the way into the anterior part of the fibula. There's a posterior part of the popliteal fibular ligament attaches to the tip of the fibula. And this is also important because of the, uh, the way we reconstruct the popliteal fibular ligament during our reconstruction techniques. So, to summarize, the static stabilizers are the important structures. They are the lateral collateral ligament, the popliteus tendon, and the popliteal fibular ligament. And this is what we are going to concentrate on when we uh, tend to reconstruct the postlateral corner of the knee. The dynamic stabilizers, on the other hand, are quite a lot um, of structures, uh, including the capsular thickening, the postlateral capsular thickening the coronary ligament, the lateral, gas, lateral gastrocnemius muscular complex, the fibula ligament, and the biceps femoris, the long and the short head both. And these dynamic structures do get, give stabilize, uh, stability to the knee. When we reconstruct the postrolateral corner, a particular attention is given to the capsular thickening of the postrolateral part of the knee. And uh, when we close um, uh, the window of the postlateral corner, we incorporate the capsule into the stitches so that there is reinforcement or what we used to call a capsular shift of the postlateral corner uh, to incorporate the capsule and make uh, the repair and reconstruction more robust. And that is an important part of the reconstruction as well. 
when you have an acute uh, injury to the posterolateral corner, uh, you may find that the meniscus is torn and the coronary ligament itself is torn from the tibial margin. And this has to be reconstructed using anchors um, as we go um, from deeper structures to the superficial uh, structure repair. It's important to know that the coronary ligament has to be addressed uh, during um, the repair of the posterior corner if it's acute injury. Looking at the biomechanics of the posterior corner, um, it is a primary restraint to virus force at zero degrees as well as 30 degrees and posterior rotation. Um, if the PCL is cut and the posterior corner is cut, then obviously the posterior rotation is unhindered and that can lead to subluxation of the uh, tibiofemoral joint. And it is very important at that point to understand whether it's an isolated postulateral corner injury or a combined injury with uh, other cruciate ligaments. And we will go through the examination points that we need to understand uh, which, uh, which part of the uh, complex is uh, injured and hence uh, which part of the complex to reconstruct. It is also a secondary restraint uh, to anterior and posterior glide of the tibia uh, onto the femur if the cruciate ligaments are uh, disrupted. So in cases of PCL injuries and ACL injuries, the anterior and posterior translation are stopped or restricted because of the posterolateral corner. So if you have got an excessive anterior translation or excessive posterior translation in either ACL or PCL injuries, then obviously you have to think whether there is associated postulateral corner injury. So how you, do you evaluate uh, these injuries? So first is history. Um, you take a history, usually it's an antromedial injury. So there is a direct impact on to the antromedial aspect of proximal tibia, which leads to a virus angulation of the knee joint and disruption of the postulateral uh, structures. So that's the most common mode of injury. Usually it's a football in this country, but it can happen to anyone. It can be because of hyperextension injury and a non-contact virus injury, uh, but these kind of mechanisms are quite rare. If this injury happens uh, in, in, in complete, then obviously the patient will have very difficulty in wet bearing and uh, he may have problems you know, mobilizing. He will also have swelling, ecchymosis, uh, and various uh, other features. So pain, he will have instability. So he will feel his knees popping out of place, or uh, he will feel the knees um, giving way underneath him. He will have swelling and ecchymosis, especially of the posterolateral part of the knee. And this swelling can compress the nerve, um, which is the uh, common love and lead to paresthesias or even weakness or food drop, which is an important part of evaluation as well. If it's a chronic postural corner injury, uh, he will have a virus thrust. Now, this is different from the virus thrust that they get uh, from arthritis and stretching of the postural capsule. Um, this is more of a, a instability kind of gait, and it's, it's a very classic gait uh, if you look for. And obviously, if the nerve is injured or nerve is stretched out, or if there is a nerve injury, then uh, patients will have paresthesia, um, weakness of uh, the dorsiflexes of, of the ankle. And this is something that we have to document um, before uh, contemplated any kind of uh, surgical planning. This is how we do a bar stress test. Um, so it's done in zero degrees um, of flexion and 30 degrees of flexion. And you hold the femur and hold the ankle and give a virus uh, stress. And you're feeling uh, the opening of the joint line over the lateral side. Um, depending on how much opening there is, uh, it's then classified. Um, also, you have to look for an endpoint. So if there is no endpoint, it's grade three. If there is an endpoint and it's opening up ever so slightly, then obviously um, it's a grade two. And if it's not opening up, uh, but there's just pain and bruising, then it's a grade one injury. 
to the most important part of this examination is to compare it with the other side because some of the patient will have a physiological laxity of the postrolateral corner. And this is something that we have to address. Uh, the next test we do is the dial test. Um, it is done at inflection of the knees when the patient is prone. You do it at 30 degrees of uh, knee flexion and 90 degrees of knee flexion, and you hold the ankle and rotate it out. If there is a difference of more than 10 degrees, uh, then obviously it's positive. And if it's both, if, if it's opening, uh, if the external rotation is more at 30 degrees and reduces at 90 degrees, then it's isolated PLC injury. And if it's increased in 30 degrees and increased in 90 degrees of flexion, then it's a combined injury of uh, PLC as well as um, uh, the PCL. Same is true with the VARA stress test. So if at 30 degrees, if it opens up and it's it doesn't open up at zero degrees, then it's isolated P P PLC injury. But if it opens up at zero degrees and 30 degrees, then it's a more severe injury. And you have to um, be cautious about other structures of the knee that has been injured. The reverse pivot test is um, a test that we do, um, which is quite specific for postlateral corner injury. So, what you tend to do is to sublux the tibia posterolaterally. So in flexion, an external rotation of the leg, um, you sublux the tibia. And then gradually, uh, you bring the whole leg from flexion into extension. At around 30 to 45 degrees of flexion, the iliotibial band will be, from, from uh, a flexor, it will become an extensor and it will pull the tibia forwards and reduce the tibia onto the femur. And that is a positive test. It's quite a classic test for a, a post corner, and it's completely opposite uh, to what we do for a ACL. The other test that has been described is external rotation retroactum test. Uh, in this test, you hold the patient's uh, great toe and lift it up. And you look at the knee joint and the tibia. So if the knee joint is gone into recurvatum, the tibia is externally rotated, then it's a positive test. You have to compare this with the other side. And it's if it's a postlateral corner injury, it's quite obvious uh, a test to uh, tell you whether the postlateral corner uh, structures have injured. Going to investigations, um, X-ray is the first modality. Uh, if there is an acute injury where there is a fibula neck or a head fracture, obviously the structures that are attached to the uh, fibula head are injured. And it, you, know, you suspect a postlateral corner injury. Now notice that to fracture the um, fibula head or the neck, uh, the knee must have gone into a severe virus. At this point of time, you have to think about other associated structures that could have been injured. So the iliotibial band could have drift off from the Gerdes tubercle. The coronary ligament would have been ruptured from the tibial margin. The lateral meniscus could have been injured. And if the injury was too severe, along with the rotation, one of the cruciate would have been torn as well, specifically the PCL since it's an anteromedial blow. Stress x-rays are useful um, where you uh, push the whole um, knee into va a virus and uh, the joint, if it's opening by more than four millimeters, uh, then the medial side, then it's a positive uh, for a grade three PLC injury. This x-ray should be done at 30 degrees of flexion. If the postlateral corner injury is chronic, you have to do a long leg alignment view. This is important because if you reconstruct a postlateral corner injury and the knee is in virus, your reconstruction will fail. So along with the postlateral corner reconstruction, you may have to do a high tibial osteotomy to correct the virus if there is mal a virus malalignment. And this is quite important.
MRI is uh, the gold standard for uh, PLC injuries, and it will tell you the structures um, that are injured. The main consideration is given to the popliteus tendon, the lateral collateral ligament, and the popliteal fibular ligament. So once you know what structures are torn and what degree are uh, they are torn, we can then devise a treatment plan for these injuries. So if it's a grade one or a grade two injury, the treatment is non-operative. You put them in a virus valgus stabilized brace uh, for about six weeks. And um, you allow them to wet bear and you allow them to have a good range of movements. Um, early range of movements would prevent knee stiffness. Personally, I would have graduated um, uh, degrees of flexion uh, during the first six weeks and followed by restrictive, um, restrictive uh, exercises as well. In the first six weeks, after the first six weeks of bracing, you have to reassess the situation. In in about 30 to 40 percent of the time, the um, ligaments are not healed, and you may have to continue the braces uh, brace for further few weeks. And um, it is also symptom led. So if the patient is complaining of instability at six weeks, you may wish to um, have the brace for further few weeks uh, to stabilize the knee. As I said, if it's a grade three injury, non-operative treatment has got very poor prognosis. Uh, they don't heal well. And hence you may then think about a reconstruction or a repair. So if it's a acute injury, a primary repair can be done within the first two to three weeks. Primary repair beyond three weeks uh, is not advisable. The other option is to do a primary postlateral reconstruction uh, as acute surgery. Uh, studies have shown that primary uh, PCL repair uh, failures are quite high compared to primary PLC reconstructions. Um, the difference is about, um, in, in reconstruction, the failure rate is about 9%, whereas in repair, it's about 30 to 40%. So the, the trend is now, uh, if you are going to have a acute uh, PLC uh, injury that needs to be treated, then obviously um, consideration should be given for a reconstruction or an augmented repair. In chronic PLC reconstruction, check the malalignment. If it's in virus, uh, do a high tibial osteotomy, correct the malalignment, and then reconstruct uh, the postnatal corner. Uh, there are a few studies uh, which are, have shown that just a high tibial osteotomy can be a treatment for a chronic PLC uh, injury. And that is um, the jury's out whether we have to do a combined PLC reconstruction with the postula, with a high tibial osteotomy or not. Uh, how do you reconstruct the postulateral corner? There are various um, different surgical techniques. Um, which are out of scope of this uh, lecture, but um, the, just historically, uh, Larson's figure of eight reconstruction, two tail reconstruction of the PLC, three tail reconstruction of the PLC. And obviously the way things are going, we now favor the laparoid reconstruction of the PLC, which is an anatomical reconstruction uh, rather uh, than um, just isometric uh, reconstruction. And in the LAPRA technique, uh, we make a fibular tunnel, a tibial tunnel, and then we pass the craft uh, through that. Usually they are allografts. Um, my preference is a tendoaculist allograft, um, which you can split up and make uh, various strands. And then you fix uh, onto the fibula um, and the tibia, that will be the fibula, uh, the tibial limb. Um, leading to the reconstruction of the popliteus as well as um, the popliteal fibular ligament. And then you reconstruct the popliteus um, through the tibia into the femur. Um, and that's how the technique has been described. There are various anatomical considerations you have to take uh, while doing this uh, surgery. And uh, there are various um, technical uh, tips that are available 
um, if you uh, go and read up the uh, Laprat technique. But it's, it is the technique um, which we are favoring now, which is biomechanically much more robust and uh, lead to good functional outcome in uh, postlateral reconstruction. Thank you so much uh, for listening to me. Uh, this is a brief overview. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Uh, thank you, Dr. Joshi. Uh, that was a very uh, comprehensive lecture on postlateral coronary injuries. Uh, there have been a couple of questions. One is, uh, which is the test that you recommend to pick up a PLC injury? Is it the, the dial test? Or is it the virus recovery test or the post-lateral test? Yeah, so the, the, the dial test is the most sensitive test. So um, what in my practice, dial test is, you, you do all the tests, but dial test is the most reliable one. Dial test is the most uh, commonly used and most sensitive and specific test, right? Yes, yeah. And... Uh, do you get a combination of an ACL with a PLC injury? That is an anterior based and a postlateral. Is it a common combination? You do get it. Uh, so uh, what sometimes you see is a fibular neck uh, or a head fracture along with a second fracture. And that just indicates that it's a postlateral corner injury along with the ACL injury. And it is not uncommon to have a ACL with a postlateral corner injury. Because uh, if you fail to recognize a PLC injury in the setting of an ACL and you have not done the PLC, your ACL is likely to fail, isn't it? Absolutely. And that's what uh, one of my slides said, that you have the, the, it is more important to reconstruct the postlateral corner if there is associated injury uh, in the knee. Because if you reconstruct the associated injury and not um, address the postlateral corner, you're repair of the other ligament will fail. And how do you think of the imaging uh, modalities? For example, MR, I'm sure MR picks up all these, but it, the radiologist needs to look into it because I'm, I'm not sure how frequently the radiologist really looks into the LCL and the popliteal fibular ligament and the popliteus. Of course, we, we do the clinical examination, but we need to call, collaborate it with the radiological investigation also, isn't it? Yeah. You have to have a good radiologist. Um, it, I can't more emphasize um, regarding that because you have to see the nerve, whether the nerve is in continuity or not. Uh, you need to see the lateral collateral ligament. Uh, if it's an avulsion of um, the collateral ligaments from a femur, um, then obviously the technique is very different. Then you can go for a primary repair. But if it's a mid substance tear, then obviously, you know, you have to then think about reconstructing the whole ligament. The popliteus tendon is quite important. And I'm sure if you look um, hard in the, the axial scans, you should be able to follow the popliteus and the LCL throughout the continuity. So uh, I think it's very, very important to look on to the MR scan um, yourself and with the radiologist and have a good collaboration uh, to decide what kind of uh, reconstruction you are going to do. And uh, many of the times with a PLC injury, what about your opening of the lateral? Uh, suppose you do a stress test. How often do you find a deficiency in, on the lateral side? So as I said, you know, um, in, in the knee examination, you have to incorporate dial test. So, uh, you know, physiological opening of the lateral side is very common. So if you see, in, especially in flexion, the lateral side will open up. Uh, if you do a figure of four on your knee, you will be able to fill the whole gap in your knee. So it is essential to compare it with the other side. And the best way to do that is by doing a dial test. And you will be surprised how often it is um, quite common to have a positive dial test in a patient who has got knee problems. Uh, okay, just uh, something into detail. For example, someone gets a lateral side opening at 30 degrees of knee flexion. And when you do a varus force, you get a 30 degree, at 30 degrees of flexion and there's an opening. How, what is the chance that he's, of course the LCL is gone. And uh, how much do you accept? Like uh, up to five millimeters, and what is the chance that you, you need a PLC reconstruction when you see that? Yeah, so 
you have to know what grade the injury is. The, the definition is if the opening is more than four millimeters compared to the other side, then it, it is a grade three injury. And then you will need uh, something doing. So that's how clinically you decide uh, whether it needs a reconstruction or not. Obviously, you will have to uh, base the clinical findings along with your radiological findings to decide what kind of reconstruction you will need to have. Okay, and uh, if the if you're following the reconstruction technique, well, I think the most followed one is the one described by Rob Laprat, right? That is correct. So the uh, Laprat's technique is a gold standard nowadays. It has got the best um, uh, reconstruction or best results in uh, all the reconstructions. And there have been lots of uh, comparative studies uh, in regards to this. And um, there are few papers show there is no difference between Laprat technique and Larson's technique. Although I feel the opening up of the postlateral corner when you do a Laprat technique is almost negligible. So it, it is a very robust kind of uh, fixation and it is anatomical. So you are recreating the human anatomy, uh, which is much more philosophical uh, rather than, you know, just uh, doing a, a figure of eight. The other one is regarding an acute scenario. Uh, suppose you have a multi-ligamentous injury along with a PLC. I mean, I've seen uh, uh, Fanelli's paper, which says that in when you have a multi-ligamentous injury with a PLC injury, it is good to repair the PLC first and early. Yes. Take on so, that. Always repair the repairables and then reconstruct the reconstructables. So if you if you have a repairable injury, you need to go in early and repair it. You may augment the repair as well using there are loads of fiber tapes and instruments available uh, to augment the repair. And once you do that, then at a later stage, you can reconstruct the reconstruct tables. That is my strategy at this point of time. There are people who are doing uh, all combined surgeries, including reconstruction at the same time, if the knee flexion is more than nine. But there is still a debate as to which one is better. But in, in my practice, I still feel um, do the early re repairables. So repair the repairables early. And once the knee is bending back and has got a good flexibility, then you can do a reconstruction later. The thing changes when there is a PCL and a PLC. So if, uh, if there is a, a PCL injury with the PLC, there is posterior tibial translation. And the tension of the PLC is never uh, the, going to be the normal tension. And in those circumstances, you may well feel to do a PCL reconstruction uh, along with the PLC at the same time, because you will have to fix the PCL first before uh, tensioning the postlateral corner, or else the postlateral corner tension won't be as good. So that's the way um, you have to think. Um, so if you say, I mean, in a multi-ligamentous injury, if there is a PCL along with the PLC, you think that the PCL should be reconstructed first before going to the PLC, isn't it? Yeah, because there is a tibial translation. So um, you have to connect, you have to get the tibia underneath the femur to uh, to then see correctly. Okay, so suppose you have an ACL, PCL, and a PLC injury. How would you go, to, go about You do the PCL first, PLC? Yes. PCL? Yeah. So so you have to then think about the tunnel positions. So you don't want to violate the tunnel. So it is a bit tricky, but you do the PCL first, tension the PCL, attach the PCL, and then uh, do the postlateral corner. And if you want to do the ACL at the same time, you can, but if you don't, you can do it at a later stage. And how early do you think we do the PCL plus PLC? Uh, ideally, if it's acute injury, you should be doing it before three weeks. Otherwise, this, the tissues of the postlateral corner get edematous and fibrosed, and especially around the nerve. And then it's very difficult to dissect the nerve, uh, as well as the structures. You can't identify the postlateral corner structures if it's you know fibrosed, and you can't get a proper repair or reconstruct. You know, then you can, then you have to do a reconstruction at the first stage. Okay, thank you, Dr. Joshi. I think that's all the questions that we have for this webinar. And I really thank you for coming online and those fantastic illustrations that you showed. I'm sure it's going to, it's a new way to make 
the PowerPoint more simpler. I'm sure a lot of people are going to see how we did that. And it's very simple actually. You just need to go to share screen and click on the other window and that takes you to the anatomy web. Uh, may I request which is the website for that anatomy slide? Um, it is the Biodigital Human Platform. Biodigital? Biodigital.com. Biodigital.com. So someone wants to look at, so that was really nice of you, Dr. Joshi. In addition to the information that you've provided, you have brought up two wonderful platforms in this presentation. One is Prezi.com, where you can see this fantastic PowerPoint presentation and the way the slides move, it's really fabulous. The other one is the Biodigital.com and you can do simultaneously, you can look at the anatomy, you can subtract what are those things you don't want? That is brilliant. I could see you just remove that DHB band and you could see everything clearly. It's like going in for yeah. surgery. It, it is very, uh, especially if you do complex surgeries, it's quite important to just before the surgery, you go there, dissect it, you know, um, virtually dissect it so that you know exactly what you're going to do um, during the surgery. It's quite nice way of uh, teaching. Um, you know, junior doctors, uh, which I really like about that kind of website. Um, they have also got some app apps on, um, if you have iPad, then you can download those apps as well. I'm sure uh, Android apps are available. So that was actually double learning from your side. And uh, thank you once again, Dr. Joshi, for spending your valuable time, I'm sure. Uh, with this kind of presentations that are going to come up, people are going to ask more from your side. I'm sure you'll be able to spare your time for us on a yeah. few webinar. Thank you once again, Dr. Joshi. Thank you. Thanks so much.